Hello, this is UCL Uncovering Politics, and this week we're looking at secular political institutions. Why do they matter, and what explains whether they emerge? Hello, my name is Jennifer Hudson, and welcome to UCL Uncovering Politics, the podcast of the School of Public Policy and Department of Political Science at University College London. Some states are secular, while others are based to a greater or lesser degree on religion. The difference matters. Secular states are more likely to respect the diverse perspectives of their citizens and protect a range of social and political rights. So what explains variation in institutional secularism? Why did some states secularize centuries ago, while others underwent a secular shift more recently? And yet others remain religious to this day. This is one of the key questions about political development, but has gone relatively understudied. A new book, however, changes that. Called The Origins of Secular Institutions, It takes a sweeping view of political development across half a millennium and several continents. It combines statistical analysis with an exploration of deep historical narratives. And it tells a story about how the development of printing, the extent of censorship, and the timing of the emergence of secular movements have shaped the nature of politics around the world today. The book's author is my colleague, Dr. Zeynep Bulat-Gil, who is an Associate Professor in International Relations here in the Department of Political Science. I'm delighted to say that Zeynep joins me here today. Welcome to UCL Uncovering Politics, Zeynep. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk about my research. I'm really excited to be here. Well, we are delighted to have you and really excited about hearing uh, how this book has developed, what you're arguing and what you've found. So um, let's get started by, you know, the basics maybe. Why should we care about the origins of secular institutions? Why is this a story that matters? Well, I think there are two reasons why this matters. One is the more theoretical one. In political science, we tend to really care about how modern state institutions emerge and why they vary from one context to another. So we have a rich literature around questions that relate to taxation, nation state formation, regime type. And yet when it comes to this other building block of state formation, which is the relationship between the religious organizations and states, we really don't have the comparable richness. So this is where my book comes in. The other reason is the more normative one, of course, which you've already touched upon, um, that whether or not states have secular institutions, of course, has far-reaching implications for individual rights in the public sphere, as well as individual rights in the most intimate parts of our lives. So to the extent that we care about these individual freedoms, we should care about uh, secular state institutions. Fantastic. So Let's kick off with the basics, because I think maybe for our our listeners, it's really important to to define secular institutions. So what exactly do you mean in this research when you're talking about secular institutions? So in the book, the definition of secular institutions relies on two criteria, and both of them are necessary. One is the absence of religiosity or religious tests uh, for fundamental political rights, including citizenship um, or voting. The other one is that the legal structure of the state, including family law, does not depend on religious rules and doctrine. And specifically, the part on family law is very important because um, you will often hear pundits call countries secular based on the narrative that here that they hear from their leadership and Egypt would be an example here. And yet, if you look at the family laws of these countries, often they rely on um, Islamic laws or Sharia. So my definition is quite specific in excluding countries where the family law is not secular from the definition. Now, if you think about this conceptualization, it's a binary one. So in this book, there are secular and non-secular contexts. At the same time, I also recognize that there is a gray area on the board 
order. And the way I try to deal with this is both by varying the definition um, or the measurement in the quantitative section to see if it makes a difference. And also I have a separate chapter where I look at cases that I think belong to this gray area, which include the United Kingdom and Tunisia in the context of the book. I just want to pause there and, and pick up those two aspects of your, your definition, because obviously they're really important. And you, you alluded to this, this binary nature of the, of, the, of the kind of variable, the outcome that, that you're looking at. You've already started to describe um, some of the cases that you thought could be you know, listed as secular, but they have some attributes of being non-secular. How hard or easy was that to, to ultimately classify your cases um, into secular, non-secular? Well, the coding process itself took quite a bit of time, but from the beginning, I had a clear notion about what should count as secular or not. In some ways, the way I think about the conceptualization is following Giovanni Sartori's work on binary variables, that just because you have a binary variable doesn't mean you cannot have variation. So I think within systems that count secular, there are those that are more or less secular. But I think there is also a conceptual line that separates secular and non-secular concepts, um, a threshold after, after which the idea of secularization does not hold anymore. Um, and I think a case like Tunisia, for example, where the family law is by and large secularized, and yet the constitution calls the state Islamic, and also the inheritance law depends on religion, is right on the border, so requires a bit more work um, to talk about. That's really fascinating. I, I guess I want to hear a little bit about your your, your motivations for, for this study. So, you know, what made you personally, as a scholar, what made you think that a study of origins of secular institutions was, was needed? So, as I said, partially that's because I have an ongoing interest in state formation and different aspects of state formation. So, my previous work, for example, was more around questions that relate to nationalism. Uh, so, part of it is coming from my ongoing interest. The other part is the way I read the existing literature. So there is some sort of sister works that look at related questions. So questions that relate to the type of secular institutions that emerge, questions that relate to influence of church and politics today, or when states repress religion. Uh, but if you look at these studies, which are all excellent, they don't really get at this sort of deep historical question that I'm interested in about the origins of state institutions and they, why they vary from one context to another. Um, and also, if you look at sort of a lot of the core arguments, and surprise, maybe not so surprisingly, they come from the work of um, Alexis de Tocqueville um, and the idea that if you have a very close relationship between the throne and the altar, the reformists in the society that emerge tend to be secular. And when I started reading about the cases, it looks like this is not the case. That is to say, the reformists sometimes are quite religious and sometimes secular. So the interesting question is, why does one side win? The other thing that sort of motivated me is that if you look at contexts where there is this tight relationship between throne and altar, that includes a case like France, which is a front frontrunner of secularization, as well as Saudi Arabia, um, where, of course, there is no movement whatsoever to towards secularization. So there's a lot of variation to be explained um, in what we observe in the world today. Thanks for, for that, Zainab. I'd, I'd like if you could set out for our listeners what your kind of intuition was then, having reflected back on existing explanations, what was your, what was your gut instinct about why secular institutions emerge? So my intuitions came from two sources. One was reading very closely works of historians that describe what happens in specific cases in detail. But also there is this very rich literature around the history of ideas. Um, scholars such as, for example, John Israel, uh, that provide a really nice summary of how Enlightenment ideas diffused uh, within Europe and why they diffused in some contexts more than others. Now, these are, of course, studies that are not political science. So the way they sort of describe the process is not the way a political science would, scientist would do, uh, but they are very inspiring. Um, and this is the type of literature that my argument uh, comes out of. 
So maybe you could take us a little bit through the kind of different components of, of your argument. What, what, are the, what are the kind of key steps in, in how you're understanding the emergence of secular institutions? So the way I approach the question is by first dividing it into two analytical parts. So the first question is, what are the conditions under secular movements or parties emerge? And the second question is, what are the conditions under which they actually succeed and I are able to implement um, secular institutions? And the separation is important because there are many cases in which you do have these political parties emerge, but they don't succeed in coming to government and changing the way the government works. Um, so vis-a-vis -vis the first question, my argument and my finding um, is that a lot turned on the diffusion of secular and anti-clerical ideas, which were driven by printed materials, availability of printed material uh, that carried these ideas and diffused this, these ideas primarily first in specific parts of Europe. In other contexts, you also see that modern schools sometimes play um, the role of functional equivalents in diffusing these ideas and creating an elite with secular ideas. So that's on the first part of the question. On the second question on success, my argument is very much about grassroots organizations. So the starting point is that if you look at um, religious parties and secular political parties, the secular ones tend to be at a disadvantage when it comes to grassroots organization because they cannot rely on a network of churches and mosques and brotherhoods to reach uh, potential supporters. And so for them to succeed, they need some time to build that organizational basis. And of course, one way in which they can get that time is if you are front runners, if they are front runners, that is to say, they start organizing early. But the other part I found is very historical. So there is a moment um, in, in sort of the history of Catholic Church where there are a lot of individuals within the church itself in 1830s that advocate for more of a populist approach um, that would organize the population to defend the church against liberals. And the Vatican really suppresses them until the end of 19th century. And this is why you don't really see the Christian Democratic parties emerging until end of 19th century, early 20th century. And my argument is that during that period, the secular parties that have different labels, they could be liberals, they could be Republicans or radicals, had plenty of time to organize. And this type of delay period is not available in many Muslim contexts, where you have secular parties emerging more or less in this at the same time as religious parties, or even religious parties tend to come earlier. And so they're really at a disadvantage in these types of um, contexts. I want to I want to stop here because I was really interested in in the book and in your description here when you talk about the availability and and the diffusion of of the kind of materials that that underpinned the thinking that informed um, secularization. So if we can pause here just for one second, can you tell me how you measured that? How did you how did you go about in this research trying to understand you know how much was available and the kind of diffusion um, throughout these you know these these societies or within the schools that you talked about to get a sense about how important that was as your, your driving argument? So in the quantitative analysis, I rely on sort of several indicators. One is the number of printing houses that were available in different contexts up to 1830s. Um, and the other one, and this one is, I think, a lot more specific, but only exists for Europe is the number of books with enlightenment content uh, that was in circulation in Europe in the 18th century, which is a data set that was collected by other scholars and is now publicly available. And it's quite exciting. So those are the two that I rely on. Another one is looking at military academies, which I take to be an indicator of modern schools. And the finding on that is a bit more borderline. Uh, but the finding on printing um, houses and the availability of enlightened books in the 18th century, they're quite robust. Um, 
for a study that uses historical methods. Of course, all the findings are, I think, they have to be thought of in the context of the broader research design, which has a quantitative and a qualitative leg. And here I'm talking about more the quantitative part. That's perfect, because it, it leads us into talking about, I think, the the, the design and, and the different approaches that you, you take in your work. You know, as I noted in the introduction, you've really done an, an extraordinary amount of research, um, both qualitative and quantitative, in order to test your argument. Um, and I think we should, you know, give a little bit of flavor to, to both of those approaches here in, in our podcast. Let's start with the quantitative part. Um, most statistical work in political science focuses on data from recent years. Um, and that's usually because that's where we have best records and, and the most amount of, of data. But you're testing hypotheses relating to factors such as the availability of printed books and the emergence of movements for secular reform. Um, quite a few years ago in the distant past. How do you, how do you even begin to construct a data set, a cross-national data set, um, that's really going so far back in time? I started compiling this uh, data set back in uh, 2013 when I was also working in tandem on my first book. Um, and the part that was most challenging because there was no bo baseline to work with uh, was the coding on secular institutions, both cross-nationally and over time. Um, and what I started with was uh, constitutions of countries that go back in time that have been digitized now. So they're available in uh, major university libraries. So that was my starting point. But I very quickly also realized that the information I needed on family law was not often available from constitutions because constitutions don't speak to that um, in detail often. So then I turned my attention to other digitized sources on family law both historical and contemporary. And this was a long process, um, at least a year or so, and then I had to revisit, um, so on and so forth. But at the end, I had this data set that codes secular institutions between 1800 and 2000. And then there are other aspects that I've, I also had to code, such as the emergence of secular parties. This was comparatively easier because we do have books that have lists of political parties, even if they're historical, with some summary of their agenda. So that could serve as a starting point. I still had to go and revisit some regional or country-specific literature, but it wasn't as difficult as, as the per first part. And then, of course, as I said, I rely on other scholars, both political scientists and scholars in other fields who've nicely coded some very exciting, his exciting historical material, including, for example, the VDAM data set, which is quite rich and very useful for people who work on historical questions like myself. You made reference to your first book on ethnic cleansing, and, and having read that, this strikes me as that kind of very similar pattern where you take, where you offer, you know, a kind of cross-national quantitative analysis, but that's really, um, you know, part of the explanation that you're giving with some, some very, very rich, detailed case studies. And so um, let me just ask you then, thinking about the, the kind of whole of, of your findings together, what do you find um, in terms of the emergence of these secular institutions and their conditions for uh, success? I think there are two main takeaways. The first one is the one on ideas, enlightenment ideas, which were primarily driven by printing and books in 18th and 19th century. And so I think that explains a lot. The second one is timing matters. So whether or not secular political movements emerge early and also whether or not they emerge much earlier than religious ones really makes a difference. And that difference is explained not only by analytical sort of theories or expectations, but also historical, specific historical decisions like the one that the Vatican made um, in 1830s and sustained until the end of 19th century. So in some ways, the argument is a combination of analytical expectations, but also recognizes that historically specific decisions can really change the paths of specific regions and countries. I just want to pick up, I think, there on, on one, one point, if you can shed a little bit more light. You said earlier about, um, you know, secular groups were at a disadvantage if they came after religious groups because they didn't have, religious groups had the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the religious basis to kind of go in and, and, and 
gather or use already defined communities than to to kind of advocate and build uh, you know the case. Whereas secular groups didn't have that kind of existing infrastructure, they would probably have to go out to civil society, trade associations, etc. I mean, how how much in your argument? did civil society organizations have to come before the religious ones to make that a really a kind of a, to give them, you know, fair game in terms of establishing secular institutions. So is it a case that you, they had to precede by many, many decades, or is it just about how quickly they were able to establish themselves with different parts of the, the wider community? My sense is that they actually need the many, many decades. So a couple of years is not enough. I mean, one way to think about it is that the main disadvantage is actually in rural areas, the countryside, where um, the churches and mosques, mosques are already in place, the imams and priests are already in place. Um, and even though these secular hubs tend to start in cities, they don't have outreach in the countryside. So that is the part that's very difficult that I think takes quite some time to build. So in a case like France, for example, they were able to do that because starting from 1840s, you actually see this movement called the Democratic Socialists who start organizing in the countryside. But they don't, I mean, they are replaced, re repressed in between, but they don't really, the Republicans don't really start winning elections until 1870s or so. So it takes some time to build that kind of depth. And it's very, very difficult to compete with religious populist organizations as you try to do that. You also see sort of the flip side of this when you look at cases like Morocco, for example, where the initial nationalists came with an Islamist flavor, and now there's an additional specifically Islamist party in place. And it's difficult for secular parties or women's organizations, which tend to have a secular agenda, to compete with these groups outside of our urban areas. I want to talk a little bit about the, the qualitative work in the book. Um, so let's try and get a, a snapshot of the kind of analysis um, that you're offering. You present three paired comparisons um, of cases in the book. So first you look at France and Spain, then you look at Turkey and Morocco, and then finally the UK and Tunisia. Um, can you give our, our listeners a bit of a, a, an explanation about what you're looking to achieve through these paired comparisons? Um, and what kind of conclusions are you able to reach? So the comparisons really serve two purposes. One is the sort of comparative historical analysis, trying to test the argument. And those are the matched cases of France and Spain and Turkey and Morocco. So in these cases, I'm matching countries in which there have been closed thrown alter relations and the dominant religion is the same. But the outcome in terms of secularization is different. So France is a first mover. Spain comes much later. There's also a lot of variation within each of these cases over time. And in the case of Turkey and Morocco, Turkey would be the first mover, both in terms of the emergence of secular movements and in terms of secular institutions. And in Morocco, you don't see uh, even the secular movements until 1960s, 70s. So... Um, that is the basis of the comparison. The second goal is, as I said, is exploring these gray area cases. And this is where UK and Tunisia come into the picture. And they're not so much of a sort of a matched pair, but really there I'm trying to compare UK to France implicitly and asking why is it the case that in this country where the Enlightenment literature was very much uh, in circulation early on, and you did get some secularization, but you don't get full disestablishment of the Anglican church in England. Um, and in Tunisia, I'm implicitly comparing the case to both Turkey and Morocco and asking why do you have this in-between outcome where there's still certain elements that are religious, but it's a lot more secular than um, Morocco. In terms of the findings, I'll just give you know one example because it's hard for me to go into details of everything. But when I compare France and Spain, 
So there is a lot of evidence that shows that there was so much more printed material with secular anti-clerical material that was in circulation in France. It's almost incomparable in the 18th century. But you also get a sense of why that is the case. So when the French monarchy tries to repress printers in France, they pack up and leave next door. They go to Netherlands and Switzerland and they stand back these ideas very easily. And at some point, the person who is in charge of the censorship mechanism actually gives up. He starts tipping the printing houses before the police comes because he doesn't want to lose business. Right? And in Spain, you just look at the map, there is nowhere to go. Right? So you also start getting a sense of why there is this variation when you look at the cases, which I find very, very exciting. It, no, it is. It's it's fascinating kind of geopolitics there about how uh, how the information was able to move um, out of France and back into France very, very readily. I've I've mentioned you know there's there's really a vast amount of analysis in this book and and I encourage um, our listeners to pick it up in April when it's available, but I'd like to maybe in the last minutes of of our time together go back to politics in the in the world today. Um, we've said that some states continue to be founded on religion. So Zainab, I'd like to get your thoughts on is the trend towards secularization still ongoing today? And what does your analysis tell us about, you know, where or how secularization is likely to occur? Well, I think the book's main implication would be quite pessimistic, right? Because there is this historical element about when secular and religious uh, political organizations emerge. And if you look at the cases that have already secularized, these are the cases in which the seculars had a head start, significant head starts. And what we've left, what we're left with now are countries in which they are competing with robust religious political parties and movements. So that makes it extremely tough um, for these seculars to, to succeed. That is, I suppose, if you're somebody who cares about secularization, quite uh, pessimistic. Um, there is, I think, one way to think about it that's maybe a little bit more optimistic, which is that if there is a way to support civil society organizations with secular agendas that can support these parties, especially in rural contexts where they, they cannot break in, this is sort of one way in which you know secularization might gain in the future. But given my findings, it's difficult for me to be too, too optimistic uh, at this point. And talk me through what you think the policy implications of, of your work might be if we believe that greater secularization of state institutions is desirable. Is there anything we can do to promote it in terms of, you know, real kind of specific policies? You mentioned working with, you know, rural civil society organizations. What are the mechanisms by which governments can do that? I suppose giving aid to these organizations would be one way to do that, but it's a very fine balance, right? If you give aid to these organizations, that you're also giving an argument to their religious rivals saying, look, they're supported by the West, they're supported by outsiders, right? So I personally think these types of things need to come inside the countries, and it's very difficult to drive this type of change by influencing them from outside. So um, and I'm also a little bit hesitant to give very clear policy recommendations beyond saying, yes, civil society that supports seculars in rural areas would be useful. Because when you give a policy implication, there might be other further implications that I don't see about repressing religions and things like that, which I would never advocate for. So, you know, one has to be very careful about, I think, giving policy implications. Um, Indeed. Um Zainab, this has been really fascinating. Uh, Zainab's book, The Origins of Secular Institutions, Ideas, Timing, and Organization, will be published next month by Oxford University Press, and it's available to pre-order now. So I encourage you to get a copy and look at the really uh, wonderful depth and analysis that Zainab provides in her book. This term is coming to an end here at UCL. It's week 10. And so this is the last episode of the current series of UCL Uncovering Politics. But we'll be back after Easter and our first episode in the new series will examine new evidence that some forms of democracy are better than others at tackling climate change. As ever, make sure you don't miss out on that or future episodes of UCL Uncovering Politics. All you need to do is subscribe, and you can do so on Apple, Google Podcasts, 
or whatever podcast provider you use. I'm Jennifer Hudson. Our producer is Abby Turner. Our theme music is written and performed by John Mann. This has been UCL Uncovering Politics. Thank you very much for listening.